come back to you. Imagine a land vast and white where snowflakes seem to outnumber people. Now picture yourself, a person of color, a vibrant splash against a monochrome canvas. That's the experience of many black people in Russia, a country of 144 million with a black population of just 70,000. It's like having a unique phone in a sea of iPhones. You're different, you're noticeable. But unlike the forced migration stories of black populations in the US, France, or other colonial powers, Russia's black community arrived through invitation, not shackles. However, the welcome wasn't always warm. Fast forward to today. Being black in Russia is a double-edged sword. Your skin color can be a source of curiosity or, unfortunately, prejudice. Will it open doors or lead to different treatment? This is the story we'll explore, the complexities of black life in a country known for its vastness and its snow, but with a surprising and multifaceted relationship with race. In this captivating video, we're poised to unveil the hidden reality of what it truly means to be black in Russia. Set aside the stereotypes and brace yourself for a deep dive into real-life experiences, challenges, and poignant moments that beckon the question. What's the untold narrative here? Join us as we peel back the layers to reveal the unknown dimensions of existence, colored by the unique essence of being black, and the intricate dance of navigating a predominantly white landscape. And here's a little gesture to support our channel. Don't forget to hit the like button, share the video, and subscribe to help our community flourish. Your support means the world to us. But before we delve into the intricate tapestry of being black in Russia, let's take a moment to explore the historical relationship between Russia and individuals of African descent and how exactly black people found their way to Russia. Unlike their counterparts in the United States and Europe, where the legacy of the African slave trade casts a long shadow, Russia's connection with people of African descent traces back to the Soviet era. Picture this, the 18th and 19th centuries, a time when Russia stood apart, abstaining from the nefarious trade and colonization of Africa that gripped Europe and America. In a surprising turn of events, Tsar Nicholas Brass I took a moral stand, outlawing the trade of African slaves in Russia, despite its tacit acceptance elsewhere. Fast forward to 1895, another unexpected twist. When the Italian army invaded Ethiopia, Russia, recoiling at the injustice, stepped in. In a gesture of solidarity, Russia supplied weapons to Ethiopian troops, aiding them in repelling the Italian invaders. This historic moment not only underscores Russia's opposition to slavery, but also its commitment to combating injustice on the global stage. But how did individuals of African descent come to Russia? Unlike the grim narratives of forced migration, the story unfolds in a Soviet script. Picture Russians in the 19th century, casting a curious gaze upon individuals from Africa, not as mere sources of labor, but as exotic beings from distant lands. This perspective gave rise to a series of ethnographic exhibitions in the mid-19th century, held in zoos, theaters, and circuses across the country. While purportedly aimed at sharing knowledge of African cultures, these exhibitions often devolved into spectacles, showcasing difference rather than fostering understanding. Fast forward to the era of communism in the Soviet Union, and a new chapter begins in the story of black individuals in Russia. Communism, with its lofty ideals of egalitarianism rooted in Marxist values, technically prohibited racism and discrimination. The Soviet Union presented a fascinating contradiction. Officially, the government condemned racial and ethnic discrimination, aiming for a utopia free from prejudice. They envisioned a classless society with racial equality for all. However, this idealistic picture wasn't entirely accurate. Despite striving for racial egalitarianism, pockets of casual racism persisted, particularly towards some ethnic minorities like Jews. Derogatory remarks lingered, highlighting the complex struggle between official ideology and ingrained biases. Yet, compared to the harsh realities faced by black Americans during this time, 
the Soviet promise of equality glimmered like a beacon of hope. In the 1930s, as racial tensions boiled over in the U.S., thousands of African Americans sought refuge in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, with its proclaimed commitment to racial equality, became a haven for those weary of systemic discrimination back home. The Marxist ideal of a classless society appealed to individuals who yearned for a world where skin color held no bearing on one's value. This period even coincided with the Harlem Renaissance, a cultural movement that transcended American borders. Leading figures like Claude McKay and Langston Hughes found unexpected acceptance in Russia. They were celebrated as artists and individuals, receiving opportunities unavailable in their homeland. In the heart of the Soviet experiment, these creative minds found acceptance and validation, a stark contrast to the racial strife gripping the United States. While not a perfect utopia, Soviet Russia offered a refuge for many black people compared to the situations in the U.S. and Europe. Their story highlights the complexities of race relations, where official policies and lived experiences can be worlds apart. The early years under Stalin painted a complex picture for black people in the Soviet Union. While their numbers were smaller, those who were present experienced a significant disconnect between Soviet ideals and reality. Woodford McLennan's research on black students at the Communist University of the Toilers of the East, KUTV, during the 1920s and 30s exposes this contradiction. Despite Soviet rhetoric against colonialism, black students found themselves facing racial stereotypes. Blackface performances and derogatory terms like monkey were prevalent, reinforcing an association with animals rather than humanity. This troubling trend extended to children's literature. McLennan's research shows that even during a period of artistic experimentation, late 1930s, black people, particularly Africans, were often depicted as savage or animalistic figures. However, the story doesn't end there. As the world transitioned after World War II, the Soviet Union opened its doors once again, this time welcoming a larger wave of black immigrants from newly independent African nations. This shift coincided with the Cold War, where the Soviet Union aimed to expand its global influence. By supporting decolonization movements and offering educational scholarships, the Soviet Union sought to gain allies and cultivate leaders sympathetic to their ideology. These scholarships covered various fields like science and technology, and aim to educate a new generation of African leaders who might support Soviet policies. Many of these graduates returned home and played significant roles in their country's development. However, it's essential to note that the Soviet Union's motives were not purely altruistic. They aimed to cultivate political and ideological allies in the global arena. This educational outreach was part of a broader strategy that included economic aid, military assistance, and diplomatic support for African nations struggling against colonialism or dealing with the challenges of post-colonial statehood. Compared to the United States and Europe, the Soviet Union offered hope to the African continent. The treatment of black people in the United States was marked by racial segregation, institutionalized racism, and discriminatory laws known as Jim Crow laws. These laws enforced racial segregation in public facilities, schools, transportation, and various other aspects of daily life. African Americans faced systemic discrimination and were denied equal rights and opportunities in many parts of the country. In contrast, the Soviet Union presented itself as a champion of anti-colonial movements and a supporter of racial equality. The Soviet government condemned the racial discrimination faced by black people in the United States and other Western countries, using this as part of their ideological propaganda against capitalism and imperialism. The Soviet Union sought to portray itself as an ally of the oppressed, including those struggling against racial injustice. The Soviet message resonated with some African leaders and activists who were engaged in anti-colonial struggles or seeking support for civil rights. 
the Soviet Union's rhetoric and actions in support of decolonization and racial equality in Africa were intended to gain influence and create alliances with newly independent nations. However, once in the Soviet Union, these students experienced everyday racism directed at them from all classes of society. During these times, black people were usually depicted as wild, animalistic figures in children's books and media. The impact of these depictions became more visible following the 1957 International Youth Festival in the Soviet Union. Tensions arose between Soviet citizens and Africans, particularly African students studying in the USSR. These students were granted special benefits and opportunities, including government stipends, greater freedom of movement, and access to foreign stores that were off-limits to most Soviets. Additionally, their curricula differed from that of Soviet students, focusing on transferable skills for implementation in their home countries. However, Soviet officials emphasized that African students were expected to return home after completing their studies and were not allowed to remain in the USSR for extended periods. The disparities in treatment were highlighted by the African-American writer and feminist Audre Lorde in her 1976 essay about her trip to the Soviet Union. Lord noted stark differences in accommodations, with some African and Asian participants in a conference housed in shabby hostels while she stayed in a first-rate hotel. These observations underscored the contradictions between the Soviet Union's purported anti-imperialist stance and the discriminatory treatment experienced by Africans within its borders. From the 1960s to the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, African students in the USSR faced significant challenges, including racial prejudice and discrimination. These students often carried knives as a form of self-protection and recounted experiences of being subjected to racial slurs by their Soviet classmates. The case of Edmund Assar Ado and the subsequent protests by African students in Moscow in 1963 highlighted the challenges and contradictions faced by African students studying in the Soviet Union during that period. The incident brought attention to issues of racism and discrimination within Soviet society, challenging the narrative propagated by the Soviet government about its commitment to racial equality. Edmund Asar Ado, a Ghanaian medical student, was found dead under disputed circumstances. African students alleged that he had been murdered pointing to the unlikelihood of him venturing into a remote area where his body was found. They claimed that the motive behind the alleged murder was his relationship with a Russian woman, which they believed had provoked a violent response. The official Soviet explanation, however, attributed Asarado's death to freezing in the snow while intoxicated. The autopsy conducted by Soviet medics with observers from Ghana concluded that the cause of death was an effect of cold in a state of alcohol-induced stupor. The conflicting narratives fueled suspicion and frustration among the African student community in response to Asar Otto's death and the perceived lack of justice. On December 18, 1963, hundreds of African students, estimates range from 500 to 700, staged a protest in Moscow's Red Square. Their placards spoke volumes, Moscow Center of Discrimination, Stop Killing Africans, and Moscow, a second Alabama. By comparing Moscow to the segregated American South, they highlighted their experience of racial prejudice in the Soviet capital. The protesters marched to the Kremlin gates, seeking attention. They spoke to Western media, amplifying their message. The Soviet response downplayed the issue. The TASS news agency expressed regret for the disruption, but framed the protest as a foreign nuisance, ignoring the students' concerns. This incident exposes a hidden tension. The death of Edmund Asare Ado, a Ghanaian student, fueled the protest. Rumors swirled that his interracial relationship with a Soviet woman might be linked to his demise. This points to a broader issue. Despite being relatively common, interracial relationships, especially involving intimacy, were frowned upon in the Soviet Union. Harold D. Weaver, a black American living in the Soviet Union during the 1970s, confirmed such tensions. 
Romantic encounters between African men and Soviet women, while not unheard of, often led to friction. Stereotypes persisted, with some Soviets viewing African men as threats to their women. Research conducted by sociologist Charles Quist Ad in the late 1980s and early 1990s illuminated the racist undertones of Soviet attitudes towards interracial relationships between Soviet women and African men. These relationships encountered both public and private hostility, with Soviet women involved often being labeled as prostitutes and enduring shame from their families and communities. The treatment of Soviet women who became pregnant with mixed-race children was particularly distressing, as they reported facing pressure to terminate pregnancies or give up their children for adoption in order to alleviate their circumstances. As a general rule, Soviet women were not permitted to accompany their African partners to their homes on the African continent. Those who chose not to terminate their pregnancies often had to raise their children alone with minimal social support. Heartbreaking testimonies include stories of childhood ostracization in school, enduring name-calling, and feelings of rejection throughout their school years. Yelena Konga, an Afro-Russian television presenter and producer, shared her experiences on NPR, recounting feelings of isolation and loneliness among her Soviet classmates. She revealed that even her Russian boyfriend referred to her as his little monkey, using a racialized term of endearment. In the Soviet Union, the portrayal of Africans as wild in Africa as a dangerous place further intensified feelings of isolation among the African community. A notable example is the 1970s Soviet children's cartoon Katka and Kuska, featuring the song Chunga Chunga, which depicted Africans as jet black, almost inhuman figures communing with wild animals. The lyrics of the song included the stanza, Chew coconuts and eat bananas, reinforcing harmful stereotypes and potentially fostering negative attitudes towards Africans. The privileges granted to African students and visitors, such as stipends and access to foreign goods, at a time of scarcity for the general population, further highlighted the disparities and challenges faced by African individuals in Soviet society. The fueling of public hostilities gave rise to sentiments of resentment, questioning how these individuals could live better than the local population when they were perceived as underdeveloped and lagging behind. The fall of the Soviet Union marked a significant shift in global geopolitics, and its dissolution had complex implications for various aspects of society, including international relations and the treatment of different ethnic groups. In the post-Soviet era, Russia faced numerous challenges as it transitioned to a new political and economic system, and issues related to race and ethnicity became more pronounced. The 1990s and 2000s in Russia witnessed economic hardship, political instability, and social upheaval. During this period, instances of xenophobia and racism emerged, with attacks on individuals from different ethnic backgrounds, including black people. Hate crimes and discriminatory practices became serious concerns, with reports of violence against migrants and minorities surging. The 2010-S witnessed a harrowing period in Russia for visible minorities, with stabbings and physical assaults becoming commonplace in major cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg. Respondents in Charles Quist Ad's research reported harassment in the streets and false accusations of having AIDS due to their mixed-race status. Despite the challenges and risks, Africans continued to migrate to metropolitan Russian cities during this time. Many were drawn by the hope of finding work and economic opportunities, while others sought refuge from conflicts and instability in their home countries. However, the possibility of receiving refugee status in Russia was limited, and the country lacked a comprehensive legal framework for addressing the needs and rights of refugees and migrants. The experiences of Africans and other minorities in post-Soviet Russia were varied. While some individuals found opportunities and acceptance, others faced discrimination and hardship. In the present day, Africans and Afro-Russians continue to decry racism and discrimination, 
facing challenges ranging from racial slurs to housing discrimination. The 2020 incident involving Roy Iyanga, a Congolese student studying economics at Bryansk State University, sheds light on the pervasive issue of racism faced by African students in Russia. The video of the taxi driver refusing to take Roy based on his race garnered attention, revealing not only the discriminatory behavior of individuals, but also the challenges faced by African students in Russian society. Roy's decision to document the incident and share it on social media reflects an attempt to draw attention to the systemic racism faced by African students in Russia. The response from Yandex Taxi Company, which swiftly apologized to Roy and dismissed the driver, indicates an acknowledgement of the severity of the issue. The company's stance that rude or racist drivers have no place emphasizes a commitment to maintaining a non-discriminatory environment within its services. However, the incident also highlights the broader challenges faced by African students in Russia, particularly in smaller cities like Bryansk. Roy's experience of being denied entry to a café based on stereotypes and prejudices about previous incidents involving other African individuals demonstrates the persistence of racial profiling and discrimination. Roy's observation that Moscow feels different from Bryansk underscores the regional variations in attitudes and experiences of racism within Russia. While Moscow may be more cosmopolitan and diverse, Smaller cities might lack exposure to cultural diversity, contributing to a lack of understanding and acceptance of individuals from different racial backgrounds. The fact that Roy, who lived in Congo before coming to Russia in 2017, had never encountered racism until arriving in Russia highlights the contrast in societal attitudes. The feelings of being dehumanized and constantly scrutinized based on race can take a toll on individuals, as Roy expressed his frustration and the stress caused by such experiences. The incident also brings attention to the online response, with some social media users expressing support for Roy, while others responded with racist insults. This dichotomy reflects the broader societal divisions and the challenges of addressing deep-seated prejudices. There's also the case of Isabel Castillo, another Afro-Russian living in the country. Isabel's experiences provide a poignant glimpse into the complex and deeply ingrained issue of racism in Russia, shedding light on the challenges faced by individuals of mixed race, the lingering effects of Soviet-era prejudices, and the broader dynamics of discrimination within the country. Growing up in Elninsk, Isabel faced daily discrimination and bullying at school due to her visibly different skin color. Despite attending one of the best schools specializing in math and physics, she felt isolated and unable to stand up for herself. The racial taunts and stares she endured became a daily ordeal, making her dream of relocating to a place where she could blend in without being constantly reminded of her differences. Her move to St. Petersburg provided some relief, allowing her to experience a more diverse and accepting environment. However, as she entered the workforce and sought accommodation, Isabel encountered racism again, particularly in Moscow. The discriminatory practice of landlords explicitly stating slaves only in rental advertisements reflects the prevalence of racial biases. Even with a valid permit to live in Moscow, Isabel faced skepticism from landlords who doubted her ability to pay rent based on her name. This illustrates how racial stereotypes can impact various aspects of life, including access to housing. Isabel's strategy of meeting landlords in person to dispel preconceived notions highlights the burden individuals of mixed race often bear to prove their normalcy and reliability. Isabel's narrative also delves into the historical context of her parents' union, a union that faced opposition and harassment in the 1980s Soviet Union. Her mother, of Sakhalin and island origin, and her father from the Dominican Republic, faced discrimination and negative consequences for their interracial marriage. The university's reaction, downgrading her mother's academic achievements and treating her as an enemy of the people, underscores the deeply ingrained prejudices that persisted in Soviet society. Furthermore, Isabel touches upon the broader issue of racism in Russia, 
particularly in attitudes toward people from the former Soviet republics. Many individuals from these regions face discrimination and the fear of protesting, often exacerbated by precarious legal status, prevents them from challenging these injustices openly. Today, the United States and Europe have experienced significant issues related to police brutality, racial profiling, and systematic racism against black people, leading to widespread protests and calls for justice. When comparing these situations to Russia, the lower number of black people in the country, approximately 70,000 in a population of over 144 million, might contribute to fewer visible protests against racial discrimination. Some black individuals in Russia today may report little to no discrimination, suggesting progress towards a more inclusive society. However, it's essential to approach such individual accounts with caution, as experiences can vary widely, and a lack of reported discrimination by some does not negate the challenges faced by others. Despite the smaller number of black people in Russia, the country does have a history of racism that cannot be overlooked. Acknowledging this history is crucial for understanding the complexities of the current situation and working towards a more equitable and livable society for all ethnicities. To move towards a discrimination-free society, Russia should take proactive steps to address any existing racial inequalities. This may involve implementing anti-discrimination policies, fostering awareness and education on diversity and inclusion, and promoting dialogue between different ethnic communities. It's important to recognize that achieving a truly equitable society requires ongoing efforts and a commitment to combating all forms of discrimination, even if they may not be as visibly pronounced as in other regions with larger black populations. This brings us to the end of this video. Tell us what you think in the comments section, as we are always interested in your thoughts. As always, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos to let more people know the truth about blacks and to hear their own part of the narratives. Thanks for watching.